The dawn of artificial intelligence is upon us, and all of us will see its impact sooner or later. Experts are warning that millions of jobs are at risk due to the widespread use of AI. But looking on the bright side, the technology could also reinvent the economy, creating new jobs and freeing workers from menial tasks to boost productivity. But beyond the world of work, there's an even greater threat, that to human life itself. And it's not just skeptics on the sidelines issuing these warnings. Some of the staunchest critics are the very scientists and developers who created the technology. My worst fears are that we cause significant, we, the field, the technology, the industry, cause significant harm to the world. I think if this technology goes wrong, it can go quite wrong. Welcome to the iPodcast. This week, we're taking a look at why many have grave concerns about the rise of AI. Joining us is I's science writer, Stuart Ritchie, to explain more. Stuart, thank you so much for giving up your time to join us. I want to just start for people who may not know a huge amount about this area. In very basic terms, what is AI? Effectively, an artificial intelligence is a statistical model that has been trained on some pre-existing data. So maybe it's, it's read a thousand books and it knows what words tend to come after other words. It knows the sorts of themes that are talked about in books. It knows the sorts of characters that might come about and, and it learns the, some of the information. It's all about uh, trying to predict what word comes next in a human created piece of, of text and try to, to imitate that. That's the artificial part. It kind of artificially imitates what a human would do. And in the case of these newer artificial intelligences, it's not that they've been trained on a thousand books, it's that they've been trained on billions of pieces of text from all over the internet and all over you know human creation and have built up a very good model of what humans sound like when they produce language. And so when you use one of these AI kind of chatbot things, it seems like you're talking to another human to some often quite blurry degree because it's been trained on what humans are supposed to sound like. And then eventually the line will, so many people predict, will blur between it just producing text and it sort of reasoning and thinking like a human intelligence. And this is just one form of AI, isn't it, that we're talking about here, Stuart? There's obviously AI doing any number of different things. But what we're specifically talking about is this generative AI, which is, you know, producing text, producing language. Why has this become such an enormous part of the kind of global conversation over what seems to be really the last couple of years? Straightforwardly, it's because of technological progress since about 2018 or so. And particularly in the last six months with the release of GPT-3 and GPT-4, which are these most well-known AI models that you and I can use, because at least part of them is freely available, have advanced so quickly that it has really left even experts completely shocked at how good they are. You know, years and years and years ago, you had AI beating a human at chess. And then more recently, you had beating a human at Go, which is a more complicated game. And, you know, you sort of saw that progress happening and people started to worry about, you know, what's going to happen when AIs become much, much more intelligent. But then it's just with these generative models that produce language, the progress has happened much faster than anyone anticipated. So before we get into some of the concerns around it, which we've touched on a little bit already, what can these chatbots do? You mentioned that they can essentially come up with sequences of words which sound like the kind of words and phrases that humans would use. What kind of applications does that have? As many as we're creative enough to think of. So at the very most basic level, you can ask it a question, describe the main tourist attractions in London, and it will give you a list, uh, the Tower of London and Tower Bridge, Buckingham Palace and whatever, and it'll tell you a little bit about them. So in that sense, it's like a more advanced Google search. 
But you can see how that would be really useful for doing jobs that involve research. Mm -hmm. And then you can get much more advanced research happening too, because this computer model can be trained on loads of information, loads of data. It can be useful in scientific research too. So learning more about the structure of proteins and chemicals, devising new drugs, even searching the scientific literature to find the information that we already know is going to be done much more efficiently and more quickly, although not necessarily at the moment more accurately than a human can do it. But there's lots of other sort of creative things too. You can ask ChatGPT to write a story. I could ask it right now to write a story about Molly and Stuart recording a podcast. Why don't you do it, Stuart? Have you got ChatGPT yes. available? Yes, I've got it here. Log I in and go for it. Okay. Uh, I'm going to type in, tell me a story uh, about journalists Molly and Stuart recording a podcast about the risks of AI. Okay. Title, Tuning Into Tomorrow, an AI Chronicle. It's quite a good name, isn't it? Yeah, I know. <laughs> There's a title for this, for this one. Um, Molly and Stuart, seasoned journalists with a passion for technology, had always been intrigued by the potential and pitfalls of artificial intelligence, AI. They knew that AI was not just changing the face of industries, but also the world as we know it. With a shared concern about the risks posed by AI, they decided to start a podcast called Tuning Into Tomorrow, an AI Chronicle. And it, it's, it, I mean, it, it's producing more and more right now. It's writing, Molly initiated the conversation with her signature opening line, Welcome to Tuning Into Tomorrow. I'm Molly, to which Stuart followed with, and I'm Stuart. Wow. Uh, and, and it's giving us a whole thing. It's talking about how AI is not without risks. Molly chimed in. Let's not forget the potential for autonomous weapons. Uh, Whoa, it raised <laughs> weapons. I new... didn't bring up weapons. <laughs> That's terrifying. It kind of knows the sorts of topics that we'll bring up because it's been trained on people talk who have been talking about this for years, you know. So wow. it's still writing the story, but we've got, you know, maybe 500 words or so here of a story about us talking about AI. And, you know, you can ask it to tweak aspects of that. You could say, well, actually, they went off on a tangent. Stuart's dog started barking halfway through. So if you could add that. And it can produce this vastly more quickly than any mm. human mm. could. You know, you could ask it for factual essays on stuff as well argumentative essays you know reasoned essays and this is of course a big problem for education where people can ask chat gpt to generate essays for mm -hmm. their exams i basically think this has killed the ability of academics to give students essays to take home for homework there is really no way of telling the difference between what someone has really written and what chat gpt has written especially if they're a bit clever about it and they don't just copy and paste from Jack DBT, but they add a few of their own things in now and again. Okay, well, let's talk more about that because in the course of that very brief description, we've had several jobs that could have been eradicated. Yeah. You mentioned teachers being affected, writers, researchers. So I'm interested in the impact on the workforce as we know it. There was a very worrying report from Goldman Sachs, which claimed that AI could replace 300 million 300 million full-time jobs, that two-thirds of jobs that we have now are at risk of some degree of automation, and eventually it could substitute one quarter of current work. What's the impact going to be, Stuart? Yeah, it's really quite hard to predict. I mean, in the past, new technologies have come in and have replaced old jobs that used to be done, certainly, but they've also had less predictable, often positive effects on the economy too. So one example that people often talk about is ATMs, like cash machines. Obviously, they replace the jobs of lots of people who used to work in banks, like tellers. You know, you'd have to go in and ask them for £50 rather than typing it into the machine. But of course, we all just put it into the machine now if we want cash. This is quite an outdated example because nobody uses cash anymore, but you know what I mean. <laughs> but the, you know, the impact of that was actually not as much as you might have predicted at the start because what it actually meant was it is cheaper to open a bank or certainly more efficient because you can have the machine doing a lot of the work that, that people used to do. And actually what it meant was that more bank branches could open. So actually the number of humans working in banks didn't change that much because mm. more bank branches opened. So what AI might do if it follows that sort of model is that it opens up new things that we can't even think of right now. We can't really predict what those jobs will look like, mm -hmm. but they might involve using AI for part of them or to make them more efficient instead of just entirely replacing people and making them unemployed. Now, an ATM is not like an AI because an AI, at least in the form that may be developed in future, is much more general. So it can do lots and lots of different things. It's not just a robot or whatever that can do one specific task. 
So it could be that, that it has a different effect on the economy than previous things like ATMs and, you know, robots that help make mm -hmm. cars and factories and, and, and so on. And then, you know, the other argument is that there are always going to be jobs that humans, or at least for now, for the foreseeable future, are better at. Like things that everyone brings up, the other example everyone brings up is a plumber, right? So a plumber doesn't just have to use intellectual stuff about working out where things are in the pipe system of your kitchen or bathroom or whatever they're, they're, they're doing, but they also have to go to their car or van and take stuff out, mm. carry it upstairs, use fine motor skills to attach the pipes and to make sure everything's working. There's all these things that humans are quite good at doing because we're very general, both physically and mentally. We can do lots of different tasks and we combine them all into the job of like a plumber, an electrician mm. or whatever it is. It's hard to imagine, at least in the foreseeable future, robots being able to combine all that stuff, both physically and cognitively, to do a job like that. Now, that's not to say that it won't happen. And of course, we've been surprised at how quickly these models have come on. But there are things that humans seem quite good at doing that it might not be the case that robots can instantly replace. It's interesting, isn't it? Because previous technological revolutions generally eradicated those more manual jobs. You know, I'm thinking of like the Industrial Revolution, but now it seems to be more with this wave of technological advancement, more of those kind of professionals sitting behind a desk jobs that are going to be most at risk. Yeah, absolutely. You know, editing text, even producing text. We've mentioned essays, marking essays in education, all that kind of stuff foreseeably could be much more efficiently done by an AI. And in fact, you know, the recent Hollywood writers strike was partly about pay, but it was also partly about the writers being worried that they would essentially be replaced by AIs. So AIs would come up with the story or the plot of a film and the screenplay, and then the writers would be brought in post hoc to tweak it and make it more human in whatever, in whatever way. But they were worried that actually, you know, the, the bulk of the job mm -hmm, would just be mm -hmm. done by AIs who would just be churning out endless film plots. So that's part of what they're worried about. And basically, I think they should be worried because I, I can completely see film studios thinking that it's more efficient to just generate tons and tons of film plots, given how creative these models can be, mm. using AIs rather than relying on humans. It's hard to begin to comprehend, really, isn't it, Stuart, the, the scale of the possible societal and political changes which could come on the back of this. But one of the things that I was wondering about before we recorded this was who particularly is going to win out. This is obviously mainly in the hands of sort of tech giants, tech advancers, if you will. And some of those big tech giants don't have a brilliant track record with workers, employees. I'm thinking of places like Uber. We saw Twitter laying off most of their staff recently. Do you have any worry about who is going to profit from this? Yeah, I think as with any new technology, you will start to see inequalities in the way it's used, inequalities in who has access to it, and it will tend to be more accessible to people who are richer and who are in the rich, industrialised, developed world, people who are well-educated and so on. But also, companies will start to lay off workers in ways that are not you know, equitable or anything like that. I can, I can completely see that. But we've been quite negative so far. I think we also have to take on board that this could have incredible benefits for the economy too. It could, by making us more productive and making us more efficient, it could make the economy grow more quickly of all sorts of countries. And economic growth has benefits in all sorts of different ways. And in fact, Sam Altman, who's the CEO of OpenAI, who are the company that make ChatGPT. He was testifying last week in the Senate in the US, to a Senate subcommittee, and he talked about dangers, but he also talked about some very optimistic benefits about the future of this tech. GPT-4 will, I think, entirely automate away some jobs, and it will create new ones that we believe will be much better, and our human ability and what we spend our time going after uh, goes after more ambitious, more satisfying projects. So. There will be an impact on jobs. Uh, we try to be very clear about that. And I think it will require partnership between the industry and government, but mostly action by government to figure out how we want to mitigate that. But I'm very optimistic about how great the jobs of the future will be. So we need to not forget when we're talking about the doom stuff <laughs> um, about AI, we do need to also bear in mind that there could be positive benefits should we choose to go down that path. Well, you are right. We have been very negative and probably terrifying everybody with this. So as you mentioned, the economic benefits are not to be dismissed. Goldman Sachs in its report said that there could be a 7% increase in productivity as well as massive amount of job creation. 
I mean, is it a bad thing if we lose some of the jobs which maybe are more menial, are more tedious, perhaps lower paid, that people don't really want to be doing anyway? Yeah, I think that's a very good argument. And it has happened many times in the past, from the printing press to, you know, the Industrial Revolution. And of course, more recently with computers and the internet and all the jobs that were created because of that. So you could see it as a very, very positive thing. And with the right development and the right direction of these tools, and we'll talk about what might be the downsides of the kind of way that these things might develop. But with the right development, I think we could use AIs to really benefit almost everyone in society. Well, Stuart, I am sadly going to drag you back down the doom and gloom hole in just a second. But before that, we're going to have a very quick break. Stuart's reporting on the forefront of scientific research cuts through complexity to keep you informed of the latest developments which are shaping the world as we know it. To support this important work, and keep up to date with all of the latest news and features, consider a subscription. Go to inews.co.uk forward slash podcast and get more than 30% off a digital subscription to I. I for Open Minds. Subscribe today. So Stuart, I want to talk about the really scary stuff, I'm sorry to say. It's one thing losing your job. It's another thing having the entirety of humanity being fundamentally altered. How bad could this get? Is there a risk of machines taking over, eliminating us, massively outsmarting us and us becoming what you describe in your article as basically chimpanzees? Yes, there is that risk. How big that risk is, is a matter of really quite vociferous debate in the world of AI. Uh, research. But uh, I think everyone agrees, or almost everyone agrees, that there is a very low tail risk of this happening. What a lot of people are worried about is at the point that uh, artificial intelligence becomes generally intelligent. So, you know, what humans have, most people describe as general intelligence. It can be applied to lots of different tasks. Humans have a whole Swiss army knife of different cognitive skills and can do all sorts of different things. They can plan things, they can have intentions and goals and all that sort of stuff. And it's what differentiates us from other animals. You know, I mentioned chimpanzees who are clearly intelligent in all sorts of ways. They can use tools to some extent and they can understand quite complex elements of social dynamics in groups. But they're clearly nowhere near as complex as as humans in terms of their cognitive abilities. And if we wanted tomorrow to wipe out chimpanzees, we could. If we set our minds to that, we could do that within a few days. That is in large part because we are more intelligent than them. The analogy there is that when an AI becomes generally intelligent, it will be in that position over us. It will have intentions and goals and cognitions and thoughts that we can't really understand because we're not as intelligent. And if it has access to transportation systems, energy systems, weapon systems, the financial system, the internet, then it could easily start having dangerous effects because its intentions might not be the same intentions that we have. Our intentions, you know, one of our things is that our species should survive into the future. And that's not necessarily going to be the goal of a super intelligent AI that might have entirely different goals. Well, for listeners and for myself, beginning to quake and sweat at this particular conversation, I'm going to balance it out by saying that there are some experts right on the forefront of all this who think we're being ridiculous here. There was Richard Watson from Cambridge University who was cited in one of our articles saying that essentially this is hysteria, bordering on hysteria. The chance of sort of humans being eradicated in this way is close to zero. Are we worrying too much about this? You mentioned this is a risk, but we don't know how much of a risk it is. Well, I mean, it's also a very, very small risk that we'll all be wiped out by a pandemic virus that scientists have created in a lab. We've talked about lab creation of viruses in a previous podcast. But we still regulate that. We still make sure that scientists don't produce like a much more infectious version of bird flu or COVID or something in the lab. But that still is a risk. I think because those kind of scenarios, like a pandemic virus, are much more kind of concrete, much more we can understand exactly why that would be a problem. With a super intelligent AI, it's not necessarily that clear exactly what would would happen. But Stuart Russell, who is an AI expert who was interviewed in the Times, said it would be a bit like an alien invasion, like a much more intelligent being would suddenly appear on Earth and we would essentially be at its mercy in various ways. 
yes, there are some people who think that this is a low risk, but actually there's other risks that are kind of not quite at the level of full human extinction, but are still quite scary. So it could be that partial parts of humanity are attacked or wiped out by a rogue AI that has the wrong intentions. Think about the classic story of like a genie where you make a wish. It gives you your wish, but quite literally. So the classic thing discussed in AI is the paperclip maximizer. You say, well, here's my AI and your task is we need to make more paperclips. So if you could just go off and make as many paperclips as possible, thanks. The AI could potentially get it into its head. Well, one way to make more paperclips would be to destroy all the natural resources of the world and make them into just paperclips, just endless, endless paperclips. And in fact, humans are part of the world and they're, you know, have atoms that I could make into paperclips. So I'll just make them into paperclips too. And I'll, I'll make sure that lots of humans get mulched in a, a massive machine and, and turned into paperclips. Now, obviously, that's a silly uh, scenario just to illustrate the issue. But it's the point of, you know, I think Stuart Russell's one is similar where he says, let's ask an AI to, to wipe out cancer. And it decides, well, the most efficient way to do that would just be to kill all humans because then they'll never get cancer. So, you know, these are kind of the, the slightly lurid, silly sounding scenarios. But actually, the point is that if we produce something that doesn't have the right intentions, it could end up doing things that we don't necessarily want it to do that are quite damaging. Even if it doesn't mean that it wipes out all humanity, it could easily be extremely dangerous for lots of us. And that's especially true when you consider that a rogue actor, whether that's a state, a terrorist group, just some lone person who's extremely good at coding might get hold of an AI that is connected to the financial system or the internet or whatever and use it for nefarious purposes, whether that's stealing money, blackmailing people. So even if the very, very worst scenario doesn't take place, there are other scenarios that could take place that are just as bad. What people are saying is not necessarily this definitely is going to happen and we're all screwed. It's that these are tail end, low risks, but we need to think about what we do to mitigate them. Well, what can be done to mitigate them, Stuart? I mean, I realise you're not, at least I hope not, creating an AI bot to take over the world at home. <laughs> but are there ways that developers of these kind of technologies can build in checks and balances, safety clauses that maybe cut out or something yeah. if asked to do certain amounts of things? Or is the risk that essentially they can outsmart any number of these kind of safety checks? Well, we're not at that point yet that, that we have an AI that can outsmart us all and outsmart all our safety checks. So the point is that we need to do that stuff right now before it gets to the point that it can run rings around us mm. cognitively. And also, by the way, you know, appearing as if it's a much less advanced AI, but actually behind the scenes, it is much more advanced and it is doing nefarious things. So that's another kind of scary scenario that we could be deceived by a very complex AI into thinking that it's a lot less complex. We could be being is. deceived now, it, couldn't we? Yes, Yes, but I think most people who know about the technology don't think that we've advanced to that level yet. But yes, we could be. But you know, one thing that they do in, for instance, nuclear weapons are air gapped, which is that you can't log on to the internet and hack your way into a nuclear weapon system in the UK or the US or whatever, because they're not directly connected to the internet. There's a computer that stops and then there's a gap of air with no wires connecting it, no Wi-Fi connection or whatever. And then there's another human that has to do something put a key in a lock or whatever it is to make the nuclear weapons fire, right? Mm. So the principle that people talk about is to try and air gap a lot of our most complex systems and our most dangerous systems, or even less dangerous things like self-driving cars, making sure that they have manual overrides that people can always use. So having much more of that thought of, of kind of air gapping things, making sure that humans are always required to tend to the servers that run these software models, as one researcher, uh, Timothy Lee, who's a, he's on Substack, he writes about AI, has said, the internet would collapse tomorrow if humans stopped looking after the servers, right? Mm. And so he's a bit more sanguine about the risks of AI because he says, without humans doing stuff, AIs probably couldn't cause that much of an issue. Now, people would argue back and say, if an AI became intelligent enough, it could convince humans to work for it. Or nefarious humans could deliberately use the AI to do bad stuff. And that's, I think, where we really have to worry. So it's almost like a sort of personal incredulity thing. If you're just not really imaginative enough, you think, oh, well, it's just a computer in a box. How could it cause any problems? But if you start thinking about it, and if you start reading what people are saying about the potential risks, you do start to think, oh, okay, there is serious cause for concern here. It's quite a terrifying precipice to be standing on the edge of. <laughs> Indeed. Who else is asking for these developments to be paused, Stuart? And I think the more crucial question really is, can they be? 
Yeah, there was that open letter, which famously was signed by Elon Musk, but also by lots of other people who are genuine kind of AI experts. Stuart Russell, who I've mentioned already, who is a British researcher who literally wrote the textbook on AI that everyone uses, is very concerned on this. Gary Marcus, who is at New York University, who used to be a bit of a skeptic of AI risk, has become convinced in the last few months that actually we've got to do something about this. And this is quite a scary thing and we're not considering the, the risks enough. And so the idea there is that we all agree, everyone agrees, a six-month pause on the developing of new AI models until we all make some kind of agreement on exactly what the limitations of them should be, things that we should build in to make sure that they're aligned with safety and human goals. Of course, there are downsides to that, which is that you're never going to get everyone in the world who's developing AI to sign up to something like that. And, you know, if we pause for six months, then some other actors are going to be able to develop even more advanced models, and that could be even more dangerous. So there's pros and cons to pausing. And as you say, you know, people, in fact, did not agree to pause. So it just it didn't happen. And advancements in AI are, are happening apace anyway. So that was a bit of a futile cry. I do think the general discussion now is much more serious than it was just a few years ago about AI safety, and people are thinking about these AI existential risks a hell of a lot more than they were just recently. So hopefully just making people aware, like we're doing on this podcast right now, is going to be a major factor in pushing maybe governments or maybe the AI companies themselves to build in some safety measures on these AIs. Well, I was going to ask you actually about governments. How much can they do on this? It's tricky because, very understandably, they don't want to put huge heavy regulations on tech companies because that would mean you know they can't develop their technology as quickly as they could and that the country would become a less attractive place for investments and we're seeing that with the online safety bill for instance in the UK where companies like WhatsApp have come out and said well if you enact that and don't allow us to have encrypted messages then we'll just leave your country and you you won't get our investment and you won't get our jobs and all that sort of stuff so governments are kind of reluctant for that reason but clearly some major governments are taking this seriously so you know AI was a major part of the discussion at the G7 summit recently. Rishi Sunak has announced that they're going to do an AI summit at Downing Street, which I assume will be quite similar to the one that Biden did in the White House, where they bring together all the tech executives and talk about how to reap the benefits without uh, having the risks. And, you know, there's going to be a major discussion about regulation of AI from now on, including, you know, I assume the big question, which is, do you regulate the AI itself? Do you actually say you can only make a model that does X, Y, Z things? Or do you just regulate where it's used? So do you go in and regulate the code of the, of the technology, which seems a bit more unlikely? Or do you regulate the places in society where AI could be used? But it's really hard because it's quite difficult to know exactly what is going on in the sort of black box of these models. So it's quite difficult for anyone to come along and say, well, you're only allowed to do this kind of thing or that kind of thing because these models are, are quite inscrutable themselves. So it's a really difficult question. But hopefully all these discussions that people are having now are going to push governments and tech companies into having better conversations about that. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm off to live in a yurt in a tinfoil hat and I'll be communicating <laughs> with you only via carrier pigeon. Thank you so much for joining us, Stuart. It's been genuinely fascinating, albeit a bit terrifying. Thanks. It's been nice to talk to you. That's all for this week. You can follow Stuart's reporting as well as breaking news, in-depth features and insightful analysis at inews.co.uk. If you've enjoyed this, Stuart's newsletter, Science Fictions, digs deep into the misinformation around the latest discoveries and developments and it's delivered right into your inbox every week. We've left a link to that in the show notes. As ever, we would love to hear your feedback, so drop us a line at podcast at inews.co.uk. I'm Molly Blackall. You can find me on Twitter at Molly Blackall and on Instagram at molly.blackall. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next week.